Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. So hello everybody and welcome. <laughs> Um, it's been a busy day for us. It's been the last day of the second retreat. And we had uh, about uh, 20 students go through and finish the second retreat. So now, now we're getting ready to travel tomorrow back down to Mumbai and spend the month of, of February with all kinds of surgery that has to be done. <laughs> so this is going to be my, my February is going to the dental surgeon and going to get my knees replaced <laughs> and uh, we get a bionic nun at the end is what we get <laughs> so um can you uh may i'm going to ask you i'm going to use the um uh, the i found my pen you know and i'm going to ask you if we can go on the board today uh because we're going to talk about uh we're going to go through actually a paper that i wrote in 2017, which was the year that we came up with the 10 laws for uh, meditation. And we can go through this so that you can see uh, what was happening when we had about 30 students and we spent a few days because the question came up, are there laws for mathematics and laws for physics and are there laws for meditation? And I said, why don't we try to find out? And so we spent about three days in our Q&A sessions coming up with things that we felt were absolute, that are absolute in meditation and saying, these are probably guiding laws that we can rely on. And so we found the original paper and I was using it with students here. And I thought, well, let's see what happens if I share it with you all and get some feedback on it. It's pretty interesting. So if you, can let me get into the um, share screen from where you're in control on this, okay? Then I can pull up that paper because I had it up in Word. Uh, Sister Kema, I, I've made you host, so you should okay. have got it. Okay, I can do it then. Okay, I got it. Here we go. Okay, so this was in this four to Pohang Mountain uh, in, in Malaysia, near Penang, the southern part of Malaysia. And the question that came up for us all was, did the Buddha set up laws for successful Buddhist meditation? We felt that this was a very systemized practice. Everybody was feeling that there was a system to it because the way that people were progressing and they went to if there were gotten laws. So this is a reasonable question. After all, there are laws to physics, as I said, and laws to mathematics, and there's laws in music. And so could there be laws for meditation? And over the years, I watched hundreds of students to see how they got stuck on the path and why they can't immediately progress and how can they know what to do? So it's always the one who sticks to the instructions who experiences pleasant meditation, meaning not painful, and achieves the quick, clear comprehension of the Dhamma, and then more graciously and obviously onward, moves graciously and onward, obviously onward down the path. And in the Digha Nikaya, the, the Buddha said that only pleasant meditation with quick comprehension of the Dhamma alone was the excellent progress. The reference for this is found in Digin Nikaya 28.10. You can look it up where it shows you the modes of progress, four modes of progress the Buddha used to rate his own students. And when we follow the instructions very closely, um, and make fluent progress, are we abiding by similar kinds of laws in the case of Buddhist meditation is the question they had. 
And did the Buddha leave some sort of laws to help us uh, to develop our meditation more smoothly? Is this, did this actually happen? So during this retreat in Malaysia, as I already told you, we decided to put together what we could find that seemed to be unbendable laws in meditation. And I want you all to comment on this too, what you think about it as we go through. And um, I later uh, named them productive attitudes for successful meditation. This is because what is your attitude about this or your attitude about that? How is your perspective when you start the meditation? So when I first began the project, I thought I might need some help. And so I went to those attending that retreat and to the Yahoo discussion group way back, this is a long time ago, uh, 2017. And I, I began uh, that one for the Dhammasukha Meditation Center back in 2003. And it was quite active back then. And back then, that group was like entering a missing classroom during my own personal training. I, I used to come there for the academic stimulation, and I liked the challenges to find the, liked being challenged to find the answers from the Buddha's early suttas. So it gave me a lot of energy, and there was a lot of group requests to discuss and understand many things in the twin practice. Anytime I didn't answer a question, I had access to Bhante Bimala Ramsey, my teacher, who was nearby, and he would point me in the right direction to figure how to answer uh, the group. And we exchanged a lot of information um, about various meditation practices back then, and um, and we began more precisely figuring out the differences and the similarities in what parts in some practices would contribute to the person progressing faster in this practice and so forth. That's why we were doing that. And together we examined how to make the best progress down the path using TWIM as the Buddha described it and supported it in the texts. So concerning this question about possible laws, in the beginning of our list of laws, we got to eight laws uh, that we didn't think we could bend or break. And these are not locked in stone. Now, I'm open for suggestions even today. It's fun to get more ideas and keep this in mind. We have an evolving practice. We're always looking to find out if there's somebody, somebody's doing something that was suddenly you know, helping a person jump forward in what they're doing. So I, if, you, if you feel the urge, if you have experienced anything, you can put in your two cents on this project. And I think this one, I think went to 10 if I, when I read it earlier today. So we adjusted it, but this is in the beginning, there were eight of these. Now I like to consider everything before I write down an article about a topic and certainly I will credit your contributions if you wish me to. So where we were when this happened, we it all started in Brothers Bungalow, which is on Pohang Hill. That's not right. It's in Penang, but it's called Pohang Hill. It's quite something. So considering identifying a list of laws that pertain to practicing meditation. The first law is your meditation objective attitude. It's about your objective attitude. What are you actually trying to do in the meditation? You're trying to clearly see how everything works by observing and comprehending the Four Noble Truths, dependent origination, and the three characteristics with the intention to reach the final objective of total release from suffering and complete abandoning the trap of the wheel of samsara, which is being reborn over and over and over again into different lives uh, to continue the suffering. That is the highest goal for the Buddhist uh, to accomplish. But we wrote it this way because we wanted it uh, to be able, we wanted it to be able to uh, encompass all the types of people that came into it. So that's one of the reasons it sounds 
like we're not just talking about the supreme nibbana, but we are talking about um, anyone who is attempting to move in that direction to any degree. So that was the first one. The second one is your mental attitude. The, there must be, is there a law about your mental attitude that it would work when you practice and attempt this or it won't work was the question. Mind is the forerunner of all states. Mind is chief, mind made are all wholesome or unwholesome states. This is how we started. So in the tranquil wisdom, insight meditation that we practice to see fully comprehend and escape from suffering. This is what we're doing. We aim to experience cessation from suffering. We secure this knowledge in our minds by observing the very heart of the problem, by watching how mind's attention impersonally moves. And this is the way that we can see up close how everything works as a process, a very impersonal process. So this is the mental attitude, is to be able to watch, to witness. That was the second one. Whoops, a minute. Third one is the law, uh, your object attitude. Now this has to do with your, your attitude about your object of meditation. What is it that you think it's for? How are you supposed to use it is the idea. What was the real purpose of having an object to use in any meditation? The object was two practical purposes, has two practical purposes during an investigation of states during meditation. This is what we decided. First of all, it serves as an anchor. This means that it is your home base to return to whenever mind's attention moves away. Now you see how we said clearly mind's attention moves away. In this particular uh, project, we didn't wanna say your mind is pulled away. We wanted to be very frank with you your mind isn't pulled away, you move it away, you move the attention away. So we went, it was an advanced group, that's why we did this. In, an, in a beginner's group, it's okay to tell people your mind feels pulled away. It does feel pulled away, but actually that's not what's happening. Your mind's attention moves away. And in this way, you are using it for a recentering point to continue your investigation. Any object has no, an object has no information about how to get to Nibbana. Secondly, though, although the object has no information of primary value, it does help you see how this moving away happens each time in the same, the very same way. It never changes. This involves you moving your attention away from your, in, your investigation to something else for your observation, involvement, and even investigation if you are not trained how hindrances work. If you're trained how hindrances work, you won't do this, you know, but the problem is that um, you will do it if you are not taught the law of the, uh, of the hindrances themselves, which we'll get to in a few minutes. When you fall off course, this is the place that you are to come back to so that the practice keeps going. Don't blame yourself when you move the attention away. Don't take it personally. Just let go, relax, smile, and come back and continue your investigation with a smile. The smile is tremendously important. I think sometimes with teachers, smile gets lost and you know, relax seems like the key to everything, but it isn't. There are two pieces that made this work for Bonte and he hates it when the, really hates it when the smile doesn't get mentioned a lot if we're writing out in instructions. Now the next one, the fourth one, your ATA attitude. What is your attitude about 
Atta itself. Well, Atta is the self and it is personally igniting the craving. If we look on the dependent origination pages that we have, we see that craving cannot happen unless I like something or I don't like something. That's so this I enters in, craving is the point where things get begin to go into gear. Atta ignites craving. Atta is the mistaken idea, a concept of a personal self. The consequence of this false idea leads us to believe that everything happening through any one of our sense doors is part of us, part of me. Then we believe that this experience of life is coming down to, coming down on me. It's happening, we have the feeling it's happening to us. And this can make you feel like you have the weight of the world on your head sometimes. And very easily, you turn this idea into saying, because of that, I am to blame. It's all my fault. And suffering comes to us in the form of personal desire to have something or to change something. Suffering always begins with me. I like it. I want it. Attachment. Or I don't like it. I don't want it. A very suffering becomes a very personal atta men, mental or physical experience. It really that's what happens with this this mistake that we make about this concept of I a personal piece, you know, this identity or or this uh, personality. Now the fifth one is your craving to craving is the cause of suffering. Okay, this is true. There is no way you can let go of craving though, unless you know what craving actually is, right? And so what is craving? This was pointed out by one of the students. Craving is this I like it or I don't like it mind. And that always manifests or means comes up first as an increase in tension and tightness in our mind and in the body. Craving is an unwholesome mind state. To change a habit of arising unwholesome mind states, we are told to practice right effort. You can see the outline of right effort. If you go to Majima Nikaya number uh, 78, section 10, you'll see the paragraph that's talking about right effort. And the six R's practice is designed to complete the four steps that are in right effort. And those four steps are very carefully set up by the Buddha as a practice and the four steps in one practice with the first two steps purifying your mind and the second two steps retraining your mind systematically the same way every single time you do it. Number six, the law, your anicca attitude, impermanence, continuous change, whatever arises always passes away. Now, every arising state we experience in meditation and every arising phenomena we experience in life is impermanent. So as you meditate, everything keeps moving along a life continuum line and bringing about continuous change. This is why we teach you, I like to teach you the past and future and the present time when I teach you dependent origination. This is why. Because you note it becomes important to see the suffering in pleasant states by witnessing their arising, existing, and existence and vanishing. For instance, joy that happens or happiness that happens, an event that's there, but then it's gone, or the unpleasant feelings that arise when hindrances come up, noticing that they too impersonally 
were not there, they arise, exist, and they vanish. So this is how you're seeing it in the meditation all the time. It doesn't have to be a separate concentration course on learning Anicca. It just needs to be clear understanding of what it is and then watching it all the time until your brain really gets it. Okay, number seven, your dukkha attitude, suffering. Suffering is our personal unsatisfactoriness with what is in the present time. It is the untrained mind that believes that everything is happening to me personally, again, because of the auto belief. Because of the effect of auto belief, we never figure out that nothing happens to me. Everything is happening from me. And that is a key discovery. We want you to be able to learn that. But we can't just tell you and expect you to believe it. You have to practice it, watching how this all works for a while to understand it's just a truth that's sitting there. Under the weight of suffering, we do not realize that we have the capacity to change course and the power to set up our intention. And if we have proper knowledge about how things work, we can avoid or end the suffering. Most of the time we can do this during the day and change the situation. So that's number seven. Number eight was the law, your anatta attitude. Now, anatta is the opposite of the atta, which is the I, me, my, and mine. And the anatta is the impersonal approach to everything instead. This is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself. Anatta refers to the impersonal nature of everything. It includes that upon realizing the vastness of the implication of an impersonal nature, we can extend this idea to ourselves and look more closely. And perhaps we can find the antidote for suffering. This impersonal perspective, this view, can lead you to an escape from suffering in any situation you are faced with in the world. We need to keep on reminding ourselves that as a being, we are primarily an impersonal process with six operating systems inside us and our outer covering the body shell, which forms the container. And these six systems can register an organic experience as organic experiences due to internal and external contact occurring. That's what can happen. <clears throat> now, working from there with what you have now been taught about dependent origination and told your mind that this is a fact. If you've done that, you should then be able to giggle at yourself each time you hear an internal or external thought um, say to you, I am disturbed. So it's a game. Can you, you remember if you start feeling, I am disturbed, I dislike this feeling, sensation, smell, taste, or touch, and you see the mistake that you are making. This is like an ongoing test in life. Can you catch it? Can you see it? Or at least the moment after the incident happens, can you realize that this is what's happening? Take a look at the advice the Buddha gave to his son, Venerable Rahula. In MN 62, the Maha Rahulavada Sutta, regarding how he should not get personally disturbed about anything, while he is in meditation. Instead, he advised him to consider any distraction as an image of the earth or air or fire or water. 
that that would consider an attempted attack on them, looking at them in the sutta. Imagine your mind as being water for that very instant a hindrance appears and the you imagine how your observation could flow around the arising hindrance like a rock sticking up in the water as if it were a barrier in front of you but it can keep going just like water flowing down a stream goes around a rock in its path your your observation can keep going can you meditate like water so this is the game of practicing meditating like water if a hindrance comes up can you be like the water and just go around it not pay any attention to it <clears throat> not get angry at it the elemental similes the buddha used to instruct his son are found uh, in MN 62 sections 13 through 17. Try this kind of imagery in your own meditation sometime. And the core message here is let go, relax, smile, and come back, release, let go, relax, smile, and come back. And you keep doing that and keep doing that while your boat is going down the river through the rapids, so to speak. The ninth one of these that we came up with is talking about your hindrances attitude, your attitude toward the hindrances. Hindrances have nutriment. Removal of that nutriment neutralizes the hindrance so that it naturally fades away. How do hindrances work? How do they arise? What makes them bigger? What makes them stronger? And what makes them last longer? Hindrances feed on our personal attention. Strong hindrance management texts, sources such as the Alagadupama Sutta, the simile of the snake, Majima Nikai number 22.6, it points out Obstacles will only become in obstructions when we engage in them. So to engage them means stop watching your object, stop sending to the directions and move over to the hindrance. That's what engaging it means or even stop sending. That's even you're engaging because the thought made you of what this is over here that made you stop sending and stop smiling to the in the uh, directions. Also in the Bhaiya suit to fear and dread, that's Majima Nikaya number four, Majima Nikaya number four, bring up the contradiction to replace the hindrance. That's what they're doing there. They're bringing it up. But let me point out something. When you bring up the, the opposite, of something, you have abandoned the first piece. And so this also is abandoning the hindrance and replacing it with something that you need while you're sending in the directions, such as you need more energy or you need more, uh, a little bit more of the collectedness of mind, a little bit more focusing. You see, you have to balancing out your factors of enlightenment. And so that's what Bayabharawa Sutta is about. And Upak Kalesa Sutta, the imperfections, that one is Majima Nikaya number 128. You've heard me talk about this before. Section 16 through 30 gives you 11 hindrances with the same solution of abandonment. And the line in that sutta is, I, when I saw the imperfection I abandoned it. So when it, whatever the hindrance was, the moment you saw that it was this or this or this, and you knew it was an imperfection, you abandoned it. And also the Bojanga section of the Samyutta Nikaya is very precious to us, beginning on page uh, 1597. 
And that one is the single volume wisdom publications for Samyutta Nikaya. And what that's talking about, I didn't really say here, but what it's talking about is the, um, the arising or the non-arising of a hindrance in direct relationship to the arising or non-arising of the enlightenment factors. And we all know you have to have the enlightenment factors need to arise, they need to get into line like this. And once they're bounced like this, instead of going like this, then that's when you fall into Niroda and experience the uh, opening that is about the Nirvana. Okay. So that's the part from the Samyutta Nikaya. Now, the, the tenth one of these is your longing attitude. And this is an absolute law. The longing is a distraction. And if you ever long for any state of mind that you cannot reach, if you desire, this happens while you're training in the earlier part, if you have a great day and if you desire to repeat a prior experience, it won't happen. It won't happen. It can't happen. So very basically, if you want it, you cannot have it. And so it's best to get yourself in the frame of mind where you sit each time only to see what happens next. That's all, only to see what happens next. Okay, okay the next one that we do is your mindfulness attitude. So your mindfulness is your mind's observation. It's not about paying attention to something now. We have to let that <laughs> definitely go for this practice. For our practice, it's the observation that you're using, that attention. Mind attention actually moves impersonally. When we understand this law, it can be very empowering for us because we can change our mind through the practice of purification and retraining and by using right effort. When we decide to change our experience in this existence, we learn that this uh, begins, it always begins with mind's attention. Whoops, I don't know why it wants to do that. There, okay. Change your mind and you change your life. That is the thing. Change your mind, you change your life. It basically means stop taking everything so seriously and stay in the present time and live life in only in the present time without the pressure of the past or the future and watch life get fun. Watch it loosen up. Watch it get very light because you're only in the present time with what you're doing and you're not reacting in the present time based on the past or worrying about what comes next. It gets clean, gets fun. Actively becoming aware of this and practicing, we confirm uh, the, by the observation and experience that nothing is happening to us, everything is happening from us. And that becomes a very powerful, um, that becomes a very powerful tool that determines how well you can just sit back and watch. Because if you understand these laws, and these are the reasons why you're able to stay in the present time, that's what we talked a lot about with this when we were developing it. You know, what is the benefit? What's the benefit if you, if you abide by this law? You can, it always comes back to, can, how can I just sit there and watch? How can I do that? <laughs> just do it. Okay. Okay. And the next one, 12, I think this is the last one. Um, okay. Number 12, your comprehension attitude. You don't have to over understand what all of this is about. And I think that's one of the biggest problems in Buddhism today 
people think they have to dissect absolutely positively everything and it all has to, you know, huge, huge amounts of things. If you want to see what I mean, go to Majima Nikai number 59, and it's called Many Kinds of Feelings. And it starts out be, just between two people, two characters, you know, the Buddha said this, he said these two things, and the other one said, no, no, he said these three things. And then they keep fighting about it. And then they go to the Buddha and say, look, you said two things, and now here you said three things. And the Buddha said, well, you're right, and you're right too. But then there's five things. <laughs> and, then, and then from the two things, it went to 12 things and then multiplying by six sense doors, it goes all over the place and it ends up in the sutta 128 kinds of feeling. And the question is, do you need to know or think through what feeling you have? And the, <laughs> the answer is no, you don't need to do that. <laughs> so this is like over, over working the idea of learning feelings and stuff. And all that sort of practice came way after the Buddha was gone, like 200, 300 years later. That's when Abhidhamma really got in there and started, started um, talking about Abhidhamma as the higher learning here. I think because it has more pieces in it, <laughs> you see. And is that always valuable to have so many pieces in something? Question: Do you, do you need it? That's the question we always watch when the operation of the meditation and the progress you make. Do you need all that information? Now, if you want to learn it, that's fine. And if you want to whatever with it, that's fine. But in order to experience Nibbana, the question is, do you need that information to do that? That's the question. So you don't have to over understand what all of this is about, just learn the difference between knowledge and vision and knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge and vision happens first, then later on, you continue on to attain knowledge and wisdom. So don't go for overlearning this information. It is far more important to see how everything works in your meditation and be using it all the time in life to confirm how it works. See, knowledge and vision is the same as direct knowledge. It means knowing by watching and seeing clearly how dependent origination works in addition or in, in works when it's in action. Um, within your meditation sessions, but all the time in your life as well. That's the thing. When something arises, the question should not be, why did this come up? Leading us into a vast net of mental proliferation and doubt, or even in a retro, in, retro investigation in our mind and analysis of what happened before that was like this. Um, an analysis of a distraction and what was it like that happened before, you don't need to do that. And this can go on for a seemingly endless time if you're trapped in thinking that you have to analyze absolutely everything. The question should be, how did the distraction come up? How can a remainder being away and sensation of the distraction occur? How? Stop feeding it. <laughs> Stop feeding it. And then it starts to fade away because it doesn't strength to stay there anymore. And this will happen through ongoing continuous practice of right effort. Okay. Now, what happened after we established these? And I'm not seeing where I know there's not a lot of this here. So if you want, I'll zip through it and then we'll just go to questions and open the floor. Further questions came up about the practice. Um, one was, I have real problems with mental proliferation. Mental proliferation is ongoing thought that just keeps rolling and turning into another one and another one and another one and another one. Can we decide to just keep mental proliferation at check right at the inception of it. No, no, no. <laughs> you 
Well, you can keep it in check if you can sense it rising tension wise, you can't. But to devote yourself to just trying to keep it, keep it in check and get involved with that, you should just think of it in terms of using the six R's. So let's see what I said before. I don't know what I said before. Uh, when we consider how long we have been allowing this to happen and establish itself um, um, by permitting, you know how this happened, by permitting a neural pathway to our brain to the extent that it has become an ingrained habit would be a real struggle indeed. It could even become a war to try to just stop this, uh, such clinging from um, happening before we understand how it works. That's the primary thing. It's a lovely idea to just stop it, okay? But would be a lot of suffering and not described at all in the text as being correct approach to try to just stop it. It's a better approach is to learn how this is all working and then work towards a natural automatic six hours arriving in your practice where it's happening automatically. And it will do, it starts sensing changes in your tension. That's how it starts to trigger it. How many times you repeat the cycle directly affects how long it will take for this to happen, for this, in other words, how long does it take a person to get your six hours to be automatic? I have tracked several students who do their practice all the time, and it turned out to be approximately two months. At the end of two months, they're usually calling me on the phone saying, oh, what was that? <laughs> you know, what just happened? And then they explain the situation and what happened was their mind just went six R, six R, six R like that. In the Madhu Pandika Sutta, Majima Nikai number 18, the term mental proliferation replaces the word clinging. If you haven't noticed that, go in and read it, you'll get the idea. Uh, it's in the line of cognition, <clears throat> dependent origination line. Uh, the symptom for this mental thinking or mental proliferation is that just before this begins to happen, there is craving. And the symptom of a rising craving is a subtle change in the tightness in mind's tension as it begins to barely change as it's coming up. Now, what is coming up? Well, what you can notice is that what seems to hit us is that a personal opinion is suddenly more obvious concerning the arising feeling uh, that just happened. The, the personal part of it becomes very important in your mind. You get into this, I, I don't like it, right? I like it. And this is the tension. I like it mind or I don't like it mind. And then there is the expansion of this opinion through the clinging. In the Madhu Pandika Sutta, this cap happens with the shift into this mental proliferation, run on thinking. Okay, it's like, like a monkey mind jumping every which way. Remember that you might not notice the increase in tension right away in your practice because the tension within your mind is not low enough to notice any increase. And this is common at first for the beginning student or for the student that's come a few times to retreats. Remember clinging is the story about why I don't like something that is coming up. Maybe I like it and want it a lot, but either wide, uh, either why either way of this moving towards attachment or aversion you can um you can um begin to notice that this is as you keep on practicing this this as you keep on practicing you begin to notice exactly what's happening if you watch closely if you are keeping using the six hour cycle, keep on using the six hour cycle in this way, repetitiously, and you do it properly because of the relaxed step, your tension and tightness in the body and 
in the mind will lower more and more. Now, it is because of the lower tension that you then will become able to notice when tension begins to get stronger as it arises. And that is the release signal for you each time. It's right there. The release signal is that tension. But don't expect, now this is important, if you're a one point of concentration or absorption meditator or um, you know, Anupanasati meditator and you've been watching, concentrating on the rise and fall, don't expect to be able to see this tension change very quickly because you have to work with it for a while to lower the tension in your mind and body so you can feel that change, you see? So you have to, you have to give it some time and work with it. And so actually, this means you are training in a very specific way, a very specific way. It allows your detection to become sharper and sharper. And so you notice the early subtle symptoms of a rising craving and eventually your mind learns to let go automatically and our minds truly are remarkable although they can be annoying when they act as little children in the beginning this is only because we never knew that we could actually steer the ship but that only is happening because we haven't been taught that there really is a way that we can purify and retrain our mind. It isn't in our school curriculum. It really can learn, the mind really can learn. And through consistent repetitions, it does very well. It dance very well, that's how it learns. So the second one is I've noticed that when radiating methods to people or any other living beings, as soon as I start to pay more attention to someone, I get many associated memories I instantly pull my attention away from my object of meditation. See, there's the, there's the little blip again. These things pull my attention away. But actually what happened, let's see what I said. First of all, we should not set up an object of meditation and then abandon our interest in watching what will happen if we just continue watching. And then Although this feels like we are being pulled away, actually nothing is pulling us away. The truth is that an unconscious decision has taken place then, and then mind's attention moves. In truth, our attention moves away from an object of meditation because of causes. Number one, our mindfulness weakens, our observation power weakens. Number two, our curiosity to see what happens next falls down. Number three, our interest then moves to find something else. And curiosity is a natural human thing. You've got to know what's there. If you were taking a walk and you saw a cave, you probably wouldn't go in. As long as it isn't um, spring, maybe it's okay, but careful who's in there. Um, okay, when we lose interest in seeing our friends smile or stop watching the directions where we are sending to, uh, then all of a sudden mind's attention is alone. It has to find some place else to go. And then suddenly mind is paying attention to something the brain has fired off, a thought of some kind. And our attention isn't on our spiritual friend or on the direction. And then one can get into frustration and fall into sloth and torpor or into another state of distraction. And at that point, there can be a lot of clinging in the form of dislike that happens. It's best not to get personally involved because which, which is activating your atta perspective with any feeling or thought that arises. Instead, you impersonally let them go, surrendering to the law of anicca. All things are impermanent, suffering and changing. Here we see that the object of meditation is the solution because it would be the recentering point or returning point um, that we use to continue our observation. So here's one other question. I think this is the last one down here after this. I found that it helps a lot 
if I take a light attitude towards those that I am radiating metta to, but not getting involved in any thoughts, and I simply keep radiating the feeling to progress on the path. And that's the right way. Just take a light attitude towards the person and keep radiating the metta, which is shining out of you. The frequency is growing. The more you smile, the more it radiates, okay? So yes, this is right. Keep the observation impersonal, but don't leave your friend. Remember, this entire practice is an act of generosity to them, for them. And so you keep the objective in line of sight, so to speak, and that's where you go with it. As I give out metta, this other less person said, I feel there is a benefit of some kind. So how does practicing the Brahma Viharas help my practice in the future? Now, <clears throat> there are specific benefits along the way when we're practicing the Brahma Viharas. This is one of the cool things about it. It's all documented and very laid out. You can test it for yourself. See what happens for you. First objective is only the first object of meditation. You should go slowly and allow your own system to work at its own pace. This is not a race. We actually had some people here very upset the second day because they didn't feel they were ahead as much as other people in the room. And I had to re remind people, this is not a race. This is an individual in a retreat. You're in a meta bubble. You're by yourself. You think you've gone to be where other people are, but you should be in a bubble by yourself. Getting to the final goal is important, but what you learn along the path and how you learn how you learn it is most important of all. You just look at it this way. You cannot run before you walk, can you? Well, the practice works in the same way. All four of the Brahma Vihara abodes have a particular kind of feeling. And there is a different payback for you in return for your practicing sending out that feeling. And if you learn to use your abodes in the right way, then the metta is felt in the heart beautifully first. And as you keep practicing the six parts correct, the metta feeling will begin to move away from the heart and travel ever so gently across the chest and up into your head. It's very important not to stop this movement. If you have given it the feeling permission to do this, not to try to stop it, it's real important. You can get headaches from it, it's not good. Just let the feeling go where it wants to go and don't try to control it when it, it decides to turn into karuna because that's what it's doing. And as it's moving upwards in the head area, it's also changing into a softer cottony feeling like the touch of the very soft fabric. And this is compassion forming and it gets quieter and softer when, while you're in that state. So the power of it goes down, but what it is changes. And in the state of compassion, you're abandoning all thoughts of cruelty. Thoughts of cruelty simply cannot arise while compassion is functioning. The next two abodes also offer benefits as we develop them. With thoughts of appreciative joy, you are teaching your mind to abandon thoughts of discontent. And then, with equanimity, all thoughts of aversion are abandoned. What is it? <laughs> discontent. <laughs> all thoughts of discontent are abandoned. And then the last one, I must have skipped this, but the last one is when you're developing uh, equanimity, okay? Um, that is when all thoughts of aversion are abandoned. There is nothing vague about this practice in the text. That's one thing that's real clear. It's a direct route to the cessation of suffering. And when it is working well, it is going well due to the persistency and repetition of using the six R's or right effort. And the brain realizes that very well and this is a much better condition 
for it to operate within your body because you're sm you smile more and calm down in so many ways. And if you review 62, Majima Nikai number 62, section 18 to 21, the sections that you might suspect that there was a significant reason why the Buddha gave his son Rahula, uh, the Venerable Rahula, advice to learn this practice well before he practiced the breathing meditation. And it wasn't before he practiced, it was in addition to it. Let's make sure we understand that. Could it have had something to do with learning a direct management method for any distractions arising in his meditation? That was the question. So don't be afraid of cessation of existence, the bhava, the bhava niroda. Many people get frightened by the word extinction as it is associated with Nibbana. For many eons, we have grasped that the body and mind that we have acquired represent ourselves. But with the eye of dependent co-arising, we have to see that what we call me is just a heap of aggregates that are the outcome of past craving and clinging. And this is due to our seeing at the arising aspect of this world only with a personal perspective. <clears throat> That's why it keeps getting confounded again and again, stronger, stronger. We do not realize that we are creating our own experience in this existence. We're at a loss with this. And as we progress in our meditation and look more closely at how cessation aspect occurs, the solidity of any notion that anything can be permanent in this existence, it begins to evaporate temporarily. It might feel that we are not on solid ground anymore. It's so strange. But then we discover that whatever arises is just an impersonal process. And what ceases is the same thing. And as we observe this impersonal process, we can become more patient because we then realize that we are witnessing an impersonal perspective. We, we can look at the world without getting upset, taking it personally, taking it against us anymore. Mm -hmm. And as we witness this view, there is nothing left as a hindrance that can block us, no matter how subtle it, it, it may be. And at that point, we can pass through a total liberation of the mind and experience a super mundane nibbana that is described as the remainderless fading away and cessation of all suffering. With the other types of uh, nibbanas that occur, the mundane nibbanas, it's not a remainderless fading away because it keeps coming back. It keeps coming back in again. And you keep going on and gradually you're going down and erasing, 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 erasing to get to a remainderless fading away and cessation of all suffering. And, um, okay, so this is what, and yeah, okay. So I wrote these last two paragraphs so someone can take this off, okay. So that's the end of this. And this is uh, just throwing it open to the floor for discussion to see what you think of all of it, because it's been quite a bit of material, but it's been these 10 laws and um, what you think about it. So I'm gonna go out of here and just um, maybe chat a little bit with you all. So how does it um, come across to you? <laughs> Do you see how they, the laws can help you by figuring out they exist and by practicing, do you, can you figure out how this is supporting you to understand that they exist like that? Oh. How are you doing you? Yeah? Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. What struck What struck me from this, and I, um, I think I remember the sessions that we did up of uh, Brothers Bungalow with, with this, um, is that this really does highlight why what the difference is between 
to him, for instance, and what you might call secular mindfulness. Uh, because mm. secular mindfulness does not generate any of these attitudes. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's, um, uh, and, and so you end up with something which is um, more about, uh, in some respects, an, uh, an anaesthetizing uh, to circumstances rather than a, a developing of wisdom or a developing of understanding. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I, I think this is, a, yeah. Yeah, I think this is extremely helpful because it just brings out the key, um, uh, the, the key unfolding that happens. I see as what you, you mean, yeah, I do. I see what you, you mean. Yeah, I'm in class, Jess. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, <laughs> No, well, wait a second. I don't know what time it is. <laughs> you can get me a coffee if you want to. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> They're coming to tap at my window. I live in an amazing place. I should take a picture and send it to you all. I'm in this little tiny cottage, okay? Little tiny cabin. It's not so small, it's actually nice. But the problem is it sits in a park. And so the park is next to a pond where there are ducks. And there are people constantly coming in the park and the children just come down, get on the porch, knock on my door, jiggle the lock, tap on the window. <laughs> and it's quite, it's quite an, an adventure being in this little place. Today we went, uh, took a walk to the new construction and saw where my room was going to be over there because I'm probably going to come back here after I finish the surgery and stuff. I'll come back here. And uh, I get to teach uh, 100 monks in March, which is going to be quite an adventure. <laughs> so, but I will be over there and there'll be a big sign where you can't go on that property. And I'll be living in, in virtually a cave, they showed me today. So it's kind of very, I always thought I'd end up in a cave. Here we go. <laughs> this is wonderful. <laughs> I should do the furniture like, um, what's that? Um, you know, um, Yabba Dabba Doodville, what's it called? I can't remember. You know, the, the, the dinosaur. Yeah, the Flintstones. I should do my furniture like the Flintstones. I should get some rocks and put them in there and sleep on a stone bed or something. <laughs> but it's very, it's a remarkable construction, what they're doing, very large. So instead of a tent, of probably 10,000, we can probably put 10,000 people in the main hall. It's just amazing that we could actually sit people in there that many. Absolutely incredible how big this place is. So, so you all have to come and visit once this is done. <laughs> it's incredible. So go ahead, you were saying, mm -hmm. sorry. Um, <laughs> went off yeah, no, no, that's, that's, that's fine. Um, because these are all attitudes which not only do not only do you um, actively seek to cultivate, but also begin to unfold and and develop as a consequence of practice. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's absolutely right. Um, the mind is such a remarkable organ, and that they have discovered after so many years. I mean, I would think they would have learned it before now with private tutors creating geniuses for wealthy families or something, but through discipline of repeating and repeating and repeating, but they come up with this thing, the brain actually learns through a set of repetition and the repetition, if it has to do with a behavior pattern, simply takes the place of the other one. And this one just kind of folds up and cracks off and falls away. And in the fMRI, they say that you can see where the, the trouble, troublesome piece was, a big thick one for a really bad habit. And then after about six months taking another set of pictures, you can see where it's not there anymore. So the question is, uh, actually it's a, it's, it's, it, it came about, I think those uh, different um, research things came about when the cameras changed generation of cameras change, you know, and they get stronger and stronger. So, yeah, and the brain, because the brain is so flexible to actually learn, 
it means anybody can use this, even, even the person who has been ingrained in centuries of slavery or centuries of caste system and uh, you know, oppression can come out of this and can change their attitude. You know, that's that's what I see. So that's it's so amazing that they get away with <laughs> probably a Nobel Prize or two for something that the Buddha discovered. 2,600 years ago, <laughs> you know? So do you have anything else? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm just quickly looking, looking through some notes that I made uh, as you were talking. Um, oh yes, um, you referenced um, the uh, Upakalesa Sutta uh, and the uh, abandoning. Um, so the Buddha describing that uh, the 11 hindrances and um, when you see the imperfection, you abandon yeah, that, it. Yeah. So what I wanted to ask you was, are those two separate actions or is it in the nature of seeing the imperfection that the abandonment comes? Because if you see it as an imperfection. Well, in this case, it sounded to me like he was talking to some monks who had been trained in yes. understanding, you know, a lot about the wholesome and the unwholesome and a lot about what works and what doesn't, you know. And so when you mm -hmm. see the nature of something that isn't going to work, that you see the imperfection in the opera. I read it this way. I, I see the imperfection of the flow of my meditation. So I abandoned that because it was causing, it was causing that imperfection in the flow. It was slowing down your observation. It was reducing your ability, whatever it is. I mean, I can wait a second. <clears throat> Yeah, when you're in Upakalesa, okay, and it's near the end of the sutta, the last paragraph is where you see that repeated again and again, imperfections. Um, first, you, you see the, the, if you see the 11 pieces, Doubt is the is the first one that you see. Okay, doubt. And then you have um, inattention is the next one. The next one is sloth and torpor. Okay. And the one after that is fear. Yep. And then comes e Elation. Yep. And then comes inertia. Yep. And then comes excess of energy. Yes. And then deficiency of energy. Yep. And then comes longing. And then perception of diversity, attention to the perception of diversity is the problem. And then excess meditation on form. So these are these 11 things, okay? And then you go over to the last um, paragraph, it's section, paragraph is 30, section 30. It says, when Anuruddha, I understood that X, is an imperfection of the mind and had abandoned that X, okay, an imperfection of mind, okay, then I knew, then I could meditate, progress, I could progress with my meditation. So they, un he un they understand that, that this is blocking, it's blocking, you see? And so they understand they're paying attention to it is what they're understanding. They're understanding they're paying attention to that and not the thing. But when I looked at it, I looked at it and said, you know, they're talking about <clears throat> seeing an imperfection in the continuation of the practice. That's the way I would look at it. 
because I, these monks were doing it all the time and they're always talking about the, the mechanics of how the meditation is able to go progress easily. So this is an imperfection in the operation of your car. You just stalled. <laughs> That's how we do yeah. that. <laughs> And in in, uh, in in paragraph 31 there, he just says, and let me now develop concentration in three ways. Well, now he's uh, going to go beyond that. After he's let go of the hindrances, then he gives them a dissertation on what he did next. Okay, and then concentration. Uh, okay, he, he goes on and he talks about the... Um, I developed my concentration with thinking and examining a thought. So he's saying he's in the first jhana. That's what that is. I develop concentration without applied and sustained thought or thinking and examining thought. And that means he's in the second, um, but with sustained thought only. That's that's that one. Okay, that's in the third. Okay, then he goes into the third one. And then he to tells you each one of these taps in. If you go and get your page, that is the description for the um, Majjhima Nikaya number 111 Sutta, level by level with Sariputta. You'll find out that these little statements in this paragraph, they match up with one, two, three, and four, okay? And then he goes to five, and then he goes to six, he goes to seven, and um, those takes you down through all the way to the equanimity is going through the mental realms is what he's doing. But you can see, you can probably weave these little statements in this paragraph into the description I gave you for all eight levels that you pass through in 111, okay? Mm -hmm. If you yep. don't have that, I can send it to you, but I have that. Yeah, no, no, I've got the Majjhima Kaya here, that's fine, yeah. Okay. Because we made a graph of that, you know, we made a we made a um, a chart for you to follow to try to help you understand <clears throat> what happens in each level that is added in and that falls away, and then another mm -hmm. piece falls away, and this is here, and then something else is added and something falls away, and how that works with the eight levels in the Anupada Sutta, see? And then how the first section of that chart is showing you like um, column one, we call it. <laughs> and those are the, the pieces that make it clear. In column one applies to one through seven. It doesn't, it stops in seventh jhana. It doesn't apply to eight. And what those things had to do with in column one were the items that may, we're trying to make sure you understood this was an aware practice. This was not something that was um, uh, absorption or trance state or anything like that. It was mm -hmm. different, not a deep, deep jhana. It wasn't like that. So yeah, so that's what these are balanced out with, these statements, okay? Yeah, Jay, did you have a question? Hello, Jay. <laughs> Jay Nair, are you there? I see Tay, but Tay's upside down. I'm not sure why. <laughs> Look at him today. Tay is upside down. Are you upside down? <laughs> I wonder what he did with this picture. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, sister came yeah, okay, May. May. Go ahead, yeah. May. Yeah, May. So um, I can see how a lot of the laws uh, go back to uh, the three characteristics and the four noble truths. Um, so my question is, um, is, there, is there a necessity to also focus on um, the, um, I don't know if, Prerequisite is the right word, but you know, you know how we need we should practice um, generosity and 
uh, keeping the precepts uh, in line with meditation. So I'm just wondering whether uh, it would be worth mentioning that as well. That's a good thought. It's a good thought. I should look at that. Write me a, write me a note about it, okay? Just write me a note and send me a note. I'm going to have to move tomorrow. So if you send me a note, I won't lose it in my whole train of everything because I have to pack up everything tomorrow and move on an overnight train back to Mumbai tomorrow night. Okay. Yeah, because um, when I'm looking at this now, because I, I was looking at, I was kind of, I was trying to compare the notes with the session, with a similar session that we did last year sometime. And yeah. Then all of a sudden, I thought about how how can we link um, these laws back to um, you know the, the three characteristics of four noble truths, um, dependent origination, um, basically the the um, you know how Sister Kema, uh, uh, Bante, and you both always say like in a lot of the suttas we will tend to see four noble truths come up again and yeah. again and again yeah, um, yeah. So I'm trying to see whether um mm -hmm. we could link that somehow these um you know laws back to um what well, the uh, laws i think the laws are kind of a little bit redundant in this effect but um i mean for instance dependent origination is an absolute but I don't know why they didn't bring that up really to think to think about it but dependent origination is an absolute that's true but the law of dependent origination was a separate thing and a separate class by itself that's why it didn't come up in this discussion probably and if we didn't understand dependent origination we wouldn't be able to understand these pieces that's another thing when they were doing it we were trying to do it in a conjunction. I'm not making an excuse or saying it has to, you know, not be included. I'm just sort of talking. Um, when we were doing it, we were we were looking at the operation of everybody's meditation and from the group's perspective, what was operating as an absolute and what um, is was there something else that we needed to know about? You learn about the dependent origination. That's true. I think it's worth looking at and but the five we teach you the um the in the first part of your training if you ever looked at the capsule that i that capsule page you know okay in the capsule page let me put that right here wait a second in the capsule page um i was talking to them about this and um i guess another thing i would say about it okay i i would say um Hmm. I don't know what I would say. <laughs> All right, look at look at the five. This is like what's in the capsule. We're teaching you. Uh, we're saying this is the minimum amount of dhamma that you have to know. This was outside of these laws. This, this capsule was built. So the first square is the five aggregates. Okay. The second square is the six sense doors. This is the first night of your training of any training at all when you're taught twim. The third, third one is three kinds of feelings. So five aggregates, six sense doors, and three kinds of feeling. Okay, then we look, uh, the first line of practice is uh, dana sila bhavana. That's number four, number five, and number six. And the dana is, you have to perform the generosity to soften or open the heart so it can function properly with the meditation. And then we say the sila, the Sheila, the five, uh, piece, five um, you know, precepts are set up as an umbrella to protect you from the, um, mm -hmm, right, five precepts. Okay, you take the five precepts and then it, the bhavana, the first bhavana is to practice the dana and the Sheila. And in order, when you start doing that first bhavana, it's, um, you're, you're learning the, the right effort right there so that you can continually start practicing having the generosity been practiced and the Sheila understood and you're keeping it. 
Then it goes down to number seven. Number seven is the hindrances, the five hindrances. And then you're shown the interrelationship of the Sheila to the hindrances. So you have to demonstrate that there's an umbrella that are actually the Sheila is an umbrella and the hindrances are coming down, they're falling down like this on you. And if you pay attention to them, then what's going to happen is you, you're, you're gonna lower your umbrella. <laughs> you lower your umbrella and get, get wet. Okay, and then, um, then at the bottom part, we said you have to have the Eightfold Path because that's the other part of your structure. And we told them what Buddhism, you have to understand what the Buddhism actually is, that it's all about change. And it's a gradual teaching, gradual practice, and gradual progress. That was in section eight. And the more that you use the practice, the calmer and the happier the body and the mind become. And that you can change your mind if you change your mind, you will change your life because you change your behavior patterns. And with, this was trying to show you if you wanted a Dhamma base, this is all the Dhamma base you needed. Teaching what I just talked to you about the five, the, the laws, which were originally were eight. And then we have them up to, I think they were 12 there, weren't they? Or 12? <laughs> yeah, so they get to 12. Um, but Teaching those laws, we were searching for absolutes that had to do specifically with the operation of your practice while you're trying to follow this capsule. So you don't want to go too far. Um, like you're going to study dependent origination as an independent thing. And um, talking about TWIM's daily life practice was the 10th piece on this capsule. And that was what, that's the reason that we're going to get to practice, uh, to teach these monks, you know, in March is basically uh, because we're trying to, um, we were talking about it this morning is what are we trying to do? Somebody said, well, what we're trying to do is basically fill in what's missing now and, and see what the monks will do. If we teach them something, they can easily share with a lay person that will help them in daily life because our students are getting a lot of help in daily life a lot of changing to be challenged to smile through stuff and forgive each other and and sort of laugh and they make a mistake and and forgive themselves and then go on and that sort of thing and they're learning a lot more balance in life right now the question is why am i teaching this why are not the monks teaching this because their struggle right now in india that's very critical is there it's a struggle of survival there's only one word we can say to to explain the sangha a large part of the sangha in india and that is survival that word okay so they do things for the purpose of surviving, not necessarily because you need it for your family and your home and your children and all that and the community, but because they need to survive. So what's happening is there's a slippage that's happening, a new slippage, a new slippage uh, that was mentioned in the conversation this uh, a couple of weeks ago, which was, um, do you know that a lot of the monks have made the decision to go to the priest, uh, the priest path? And I said, what do you mean? Well, the priest path shows up at your house and says, let's barter on how much it's going to cost for me to bless your house and how much will it cost for me to bless your wedding. And they want to perform weddings because they can make money performing weddings. Why should we be cut out of this? Let's go, let's go perform the weddings ourselves instead of expecting them to come and get the blessing from us afterwards. You see? So for this is a change. This is a significant change that's happening. You know, and it wasn't as prevalent to be in the mainstream uh, topics of conversation until I ran into it a, a few weeks ago. And so I expected it. And the reason I expected it is because I said the only way that you're going to describe what's going on here is with one word, and that is the necessity for survival if you get into ropes. Okay? So you're, you're, when you're here, you are in a land. Look, when I'm in, I'm in Sri Lanka, almost any part of Sri Lanka, if I'm in Sri Lanka and I'm in my orange robes, I can take my bowl and I can go out and get food. There's no problem. And I will find shelter, even if it's in a shed next to the house, but I'll find shelter. There's no problem. Over here, that's not in the culture anymore. It's gone. 
And so you talk about a problem of setting up a, uh, a um, you know, an alms round for some people in America. Well, let's talk about setting up an alms round for people to naturally understand what you're doing here. You see, that is, that is, um, that is, um, right, I can swipe that. That is, that is the issue here. And so these changes are beginning to hit more and more. I thought that we were moving a little bit in a good direction in some areas, but I can see what's happened. <laughs> and um, this is a big deal to make the decision to come to this place. And we've been, we have been attempting to handle uh, trilingual retreats with the translations in Hindu and Marathi and English. We have been doing uh, just English retreats in for educated groups of people in certain places. And it's been um, a real challenge, you know? But to make the decision to stay here was a heart thing and a mind thing. I wanted to go to the South, but going to the South to me was like um, checking out of the real issues that are facing India with Buddhism. To me, it was. Because what's structurally down there is uh, all English speaking, which is a delight. As you guys may know, I taught the nuns, you know, in Pune. And when I did that, they were all English speaking and it was divine. <laughs> and it was so much fun because I found out we were right the way that we're approaching this and the way we're teaching because of the fantastic success that retreat brought. So we see what would happen if we're teaching in English. But when I'm here, I have to have translators, which makes life interesting because there are young people coming out now saying we want to learn to be translators. We want to be teachers. We are, some of them want to be monks, but mama, <laughs> mama Kama won't let them in to run away from life until they figured out life first, you see. So I send them all to school a lot of times. I say, you go to school and prove you can go through school. And then you come out and you tell me what you want to do. I'll still be here. You know, and you come out and tell me what you want to do. But the monks, the monastic life is not a place to run away to, to escape life. And right now, one of the, the most interesting parts is almost every drama in lay life exists within the Sangha structures. <laughs> you don't you don't escape those things. You learn how to support each other to be a little calmer about accepting things, but you don't get to escape the dramas, you see. It's not an escape route. <laughs> yeah. So what, yeah, coming back to that, come back. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Um, no, Sister Kema, actually, I just wanted to add another comment. So that sentence um, that you wrote in the article just now about, it's all about understanding how um, each of these operating systems work. Um, I think you mentioned something like the six operating systems. Mm -hmm. I, I really liked that sentence um, because that to me pretty much summarizes or um, more like puts into perspective dependent origination from a um, 21st century uh, terminology, so to speak, or in a way that younger people could understand. And where I'm coming from is um, yesterday, I suddenly had a thought in my head that the Buddha, the historical Buddha, he, I think, in my opinion, correct me if I'm wrong, he was like the universal life hacker, if you understand what I mean. So <laughs> he was an activist. He was an activist. Yeah, yeah. Totally was, an activist, you know. Yeah, he, he was. You know, we talk about him being calm and everything, and he was calm. But yeah. I mean, you know, we told this one guy, if you disagree with me, I'm going to, you know, the lightning will strike you into seven pieces. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. liked that. One. I mean, he wasn't always calm, but he had a subtle way of being calm, you know. And um, he never really said to you, you know, you Pulton, you're totally wrong. That's nonsense. No, no, he would never do that. He would take you to the point in the conversation where you would have to repeat, you know, figure it out for yourself in front of him. And then you'd come around to his point of view every time. It's a remarkable thing. And lots of us would like to be that sharp of it. But, you know, like, uh, 
the tragedy is in, in our lives that we're in relationships and stuff. If we have one disagreement, you know, sometimes people decide, well, that's it. That's it. There is no, no stepping back. Even if the person the next day feels terrible and apologizes, it's no use because the other person just decided, oh, that wasn't what I thought it was. It was imperfect. Oh boy. And then they're out, they're gone. You know, and it's like you, you sit here and you say, okay, fine. <laughs> Okay, fine. What am I? What are you supposed to do? You see, but but it's it's a shame that people don't really get what uh, this is all about. It's totally, um, you know, basically uh, just going in the present time and just letting things go. And when things happen, understanding whatever happens in your life, whatever it is, it wasn't there, was it? And then it came, and it rose up, and it was there. And then it passed away, right? And the only reason it's bothering you at all is because you're keeping it alive. That's what's going on here, you see? And this keeping it alive through mental proliferation, this is the whole thing, this mental proliferation that besets a man in number 18. I love that. I love that whole, um, well, the funny thing is I can never find that thing, it's war and peace, you know? And my mother used to say, are you reading war and peace? I said, no, I'm not reading war and peace. My teacher's telling me about war and peace. <laughs> you know, it's like for real, you know? And it's like, he gets the whole thing in one, one paragraph, he gets war and then he gets one, in one paragraph, he gets peace. So he says, as to the source, through which perceptions and notions are born of pro mental proliferation, beset a man, you know, irritate a man or confuse a man. If nothing is found to delight in, welcome and hold on to, this is the end of the underlying tendency to lust, of the underlying tendency to aversion, of the underlying tendency to views, and the underlying tendencies to doubt, and the underlying tendencies to concede, and the underlying tendency to desire for, and we always say more reactions, okay. desire for more reactions, desire for being, but we say desire for more reactions. Like you feel you're being so good because you're not reacting. It's time to react again. <laughs> you start, did you ever feel that way? Like things are too quiet and then all of a sudden something happens. Oh, here we are. We're just, you know, it's time, time for a reaction again. Well, so I put in underlying tendency to desire for more reactions of the underlying tendency to ignorance, which is the reason for the reaction. Okay, this is the end of resorting to rods and weapons to of quarrels and brawls, disputes, recrimination, malicious words and false speech. Here, these evil unwholesome states will cease without remainder. There you go, that's peace. And the one before it that came just before it was the one that was the cause of war, the one where all those things were there. In other words, we were just full of resorting to rods and weapons, quarrels, brawls, disputes, recrimination, malicious words, and false speech. So <laughs> that's all we need, just let it go. So we have a new word I need to tell you came out of this retreat. I don't know if I told you last week or not. I'm not sure. Zaudia. Zaudia turns out to be the word for Zaudia. Let it go. Never mind. That's the Marathi word for just letting everything go. So Zaudia this week. And you, you keep smiling. That's what you do. Okay. Is Jay here? I, I, he, I see Jay's. And not his mic is off or on, I guess, but I don't see Jay. Dr. Weir is here. Hi. Yes, Hugh Poulton is here. <laughs> um, I just want to pick up on that last uh, last comment that you were making there. Um, the be staying in the present time uh, is, as you're describing, very very important. But my my understanding is that what we need to do 
And why it's the present time and not the present moment is that we need to retain an understanding of the context of the experience. And it's the context of the experience that then gives us the understanding. And if we're too much caught up in just staying in the present moment, yes, uh, we, we don't get that reaction, but we don't build any understanding either. Would you, would, could you say a little more about that, whether that, that feels right to you or? Well, the idea of the present moment, stay in the present moment, is not impossible, okay? But it isn't for the beginner. You see, I go back to the pendulum when I'm in class, when somebody brings this up, because the whole point is that you, you know, you're caught on either the three or this or the nine, and I want you to end up in the six here. Once you end up balanced in the six, then if you're calm enough, you probably could stay in the present moment. And I mean, we have anagamis who are pretty advanced. I mean, they're, they're sitting like anywhere from 11 to 25, 30 hours at a time, you know, and if they are doing those kinds of things, they can watch the moments, but we can't watch the moments. And this is like saying, well, shouldn't I be able to ride a 28 speed bike when I first start riding bicycles? Why can't I just get on that? Why can't I just get in a jet and fly a jet? Why do I have to use these experimental planes with 128 cotter pins that I have to put in place before I get in to, you know, little tiny, tiny planes that I buzz around at 3000 feet? Why do I have to do that? Why can't I just go fly a jet? Well, it's a dumb question if you want my opinion. It's a dumb question because you want it. But this is our instant gratification generation. We want everything right now. So the whole the whole thing, you know, it was a fad and a, just a fluent thing of stay in the present moment. But it was a joke for most people. It can even give you a headache because you're not going to be able to make any sense of it at all. Because before you can stay in the present moment, you have to be able to stay in the present time doing your chore at work. When you come home and you sit in meditation, you have to be able to stay in the present hour when you sit, then two hours or three hours and see what happens if you can actually stay, stay there like that and watch just the quiet mind. What, and the more you, deeper you go, you will get to the present moment. If you want to go for the nanosecond, that's your business, <laughs> you know, because they're all there. But the, but the point is, what is that doing for you in life, in your relationships, helping people? This is where this, this whole uh, Buddhist uh, thing goes, goes on some kind of other track where mm. people are really wanting to say, I'm a Buddhist and I'm proud of it and it makes my life happier and it makes me more peaceful and we get along well and our family is happy. That would be a great thing if I could have everybody in this area around here doing that. That would make me really feel, that would be really great to see that operating like that. But instead, people want to go into the finest point as fast as they can. I was shocked when I had somebody in retreat give me a note and say, you know, I feel totally left behind. Everybody's ahead of me. And listen, that was the first day of the retreat. We didn't even have interviews until the next day the first interview, and I'm thinking, wait a second, what is happening here? Where did we lose out in, in how did we write something wrong that somebody would write that and saying, I'm out of breath, I'm trying to catch up with everybody, and you're in the first 24 hours of a retreat. I just kind of let it go by. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know what to say to the person, except, you know, there's no race here, so I decided Dhamma Gavesi said, Bhante Dhamma Gavesi said, what are you going to do? I said, mm, put them all in a meta bubble. Not together, though. <laughs> One meta bubble for each person. <laughs> One meta bubble for each person. Teach them how to build a meta bubble around themselves, you know, and uh, stay in that while they're in the retreat. They don't have to let anybody else in, and they don't have to go in to bother anybody else. That's the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we, 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 we make assumptions and then we lose in retreats because we didn't say enough about that in the beginning of this retreat. We didn't say enough about it. So, you know, we learned a lot in this retreat that we have to try to, um, I don't know, we have to try to um, uh, 
how differentiate or get clear in the very beginning who's in the retreat, who's there. That's what we have to do. And it's not an easy thing to do. It's really not. So that's, that's it. Yeah. You all done? Yeah. You got another one? May? Uh, Sister Kema, uh, I was wondering whether I could, if I may, ask a question uh, regarding the meditation, the practice itself. Sure, yeah. sure. Oh. Um, so I, I'm, I'm still doing the forgiveness meditation, uh, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a question. So, you know, when we use, the, you know, the phrase like, so I'm, I'm doing the forgiveness meditation uh, to uh, a family member. So when I do the uh, I forgive you for not understanding or I forgive you for uh, causing you, yourself and other people pain. And when, when I know a subtle uh, kind of ego almost, it's very subtle, but it, it, it does come up and it rises the moment I have that phrase. Is that a hindrance by itself? Should I six out that first and then go back and keep doing that? Or like you, like you have a reservation saying it to the person, sort of like it's pulling more, you back and saying it to the person. That that is one hindrance that I'm already working on. But now there's another one where it almost feel like I feel like I'm superior. I, <laughs> I it's like. Uh, it's almost like, I, I, I don't know how to explain it, but it almost feels like oh, I forgive you for not understanding, but almost like as though I understand, <laughs> you know, if you know. Well, what you I, should do a, I forgive myself for not understanding why I said that. I forgive you for not understanding that way. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, I, because I, it's like, yeah, okay, Susie, I forgive myself for, hmm. <laughs> You know, I forgive myself for, for, um, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's working, if the person is coming up and you're saying it, and then you're saying, you have to be very sincere and say, see the person in your mind and say it to them. And then they have to come back, you know? And if it gets goofy, don't make it too complex. Keep it very simple and just, you know, say it, but really mean it to the person. Close your eyes and see them. I forgive you for not understanding. And then, you know, I forgive you for not understanding. I forgive yeah. myself for not understanding. I forgive you for not understanding. And see where it goes. Just see where it goes. you have to go. Don't feel bad if you feel like bursting out laughing and starting again. Burst out laughing and start again. <laughs> That's my advice. Because yeah. sometimes things like that come in and you're there like, okay, where did that come from? You know, yeah. okay, so you can sit there and laugh about that and then yeah. start again and try it again. You know, don't be shy about that. You're probably in the bedroom by yourself. <laughs> so don't worry about it. You know, just try it again. Okay. The other thing, if I may, I think there's another thing that's coming up now, which is doubt. So what happened is because I was practicing forgiveness on uh, different people, different family mm -hmm. members, friends, whatever. And yeah. in the, um, for like, uh, you know, more than a year and stuff. And um, noticing how, oh, I thought, you know, I clear it and all that. And then about two weeks ago, realized that, oh, wait, hang on. No, there's something really deep going on there. And I'm, when I really go back to a, a particular family member and really went further with the forgiveness, then I realized, oh my goodness, that there, there's really some skeletons in the closet that I really haven't cleared. So that's, I mean, I've had that happen. I've had that happen and it can go on for a month. I mean, things are keeping rolling up and rolling up and rolling up. Just keep going through them until you get to the end. And then it's really fun when you get to the end. There really okay. is an end. The point okay. is there really is an end, but it can be like, you know, um, it was that thing, you know, we went to a birthday party and we went in the house. We were about like 10 years old and this woman had set up a spider web for us. You know, I don't know if you've ever done that. And she had the spider web and we were each given a thing to follow through the web to get to the prize for the party we were at. And it was like, I thought you'd never get there as soon as you thought you'd get tangled up with somebody and then you had to get through there. And that's kind of what forgiveness is like sometimes. You think that you're just going to take the thread and you're going to get to the end of it. And then it's hooked on to something else that's hooked on to something else that's hooked on to something else. Uh -huh. That's when it's actually, that's an interesting one and it's worth it 
to spend some time with it and just keep going and write down where it went you, when, as you go. You look at it later and you just want to die some hysterical laughter, you know, of this, how could this go on and on and on and on? Look at this. It's like a mental proliferation of a, a party where there's no end to the spider web. You can't get to the end of it. And you just keep going. But if you get to the end of it, it's very, very rewarding because the person is like clean and you think, wow, there was a real history there. You know, okay. Okay. I mean, I didn't I didn't know I made my aunt mad by stepping on her foot when I was three years old. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's like you don't know where it's going to go. Look at yeah. look at the man in, in uh, Australia who was working on forgiveness and he um, he went to the grocery store. He was uh, he went to the grocery store and lo and behold, there was a woman in the grocery store that had been the woman who he had sat behind her in third grade. And um, he, they chatted for a few minutes. He didn't know she was still there in Canberra. And <laughs> they chatted for a few minutes. And then they left, he left, but driving home, he started feeling really, really guilty, terrifically guilty. Because do you know who she was in third grade? He sat behind her and she had long pigtails and he would irritate her until she would do something that the teacher would see and then blame her. And he would say, I don't know what she was doing. I don't know, <laughs> like that. And he used to get her in trouble all the time in third grade with her teacher. He, and so he went home and he starts working on her and he eventually got to the end of this, but it was a long time. It's a long time because all the different things and jokes that he pulled on her and all this other stuff came up. And here she was, a beautiful, beautiful lady, you know, in her 40s. <laughs> you know? And he, they remembered each other. And then he goes back and has to clean all this stuff up from third grade. He said, I thought I was all finished. And look at what was in the closet. I said, yeah, you, you never know what's in the closet. You found the person was in a closet, but um you didn't know what else was in the closet, did you? <laughs> yeah. You see? Um, yeah. But I, I just wanted to ask a question on that. So because I thought I had cleared it before, but now realize that I hadn't, now when I'm seeing that other person um, smile back to me, I'm, I'm kind of having a little bit of a doubt that it's finished. And my intuition is almost telling me, no, I don't think it's finished yet. Even though- No, don't, don't, let, don't let doubt trick you. Just keep working through it and clean lines again and again and again till you get to the end. Because that's like what doubt is trying to, doubt's trying to mess up the line. Don't do that. You see it as doubt? You check it out this week and tell me what you think it is next week, okay? <laughs> okay. Okay? <laughs> but keep going with it, keep going. Hey, Everett, how is everything going with you? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, fine. Um, everything's going well. Nothing really to, uh, to comment or uh, ask. <laughs> yeah? How's your meditation going? Are you doing okay? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm doing well. Yeah, it's... it's um, um, how, how to put it, um, I am um, re relaxing a bit more and I, I'm getting a, a, a better feel for, uh, for a more, for let's say a more impersonal uh, perspective. So that's nice. Are you smiling? Are you smiling more? You need to smile a lot, okay? <laughs> you gotta keep smiling you got a good smile you got a good smile you gotta use it i was talking to the group today now they know how to smile now i said to the last thing i told them before we finish this retreat i said now you all know how to smile but the question is what makes your smile worth a million dollars it's not when you smile it's when you go out and find somebody to give that smile to even if it's the person at the donut store or the person you buy the bread from it doesn't matter when you give it away, that's when you start to feel more and you and you smile. You just, you smile into everything. That's what you need to try to do. Yeah, okay? Yeah. 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 Thanks. You give it a whirl this week and see where it goes, okay? You all need to take it out on the streets now and go for it. <laughs>
<laughs> this is the modern activation age of the Buddhist. Buddhist activation. <laughs> you know, actually, uh, not exactly activism, but, you know, what, to make this world decide to smile. Wow, that's a good one. Well, we wanted a challenge, right? Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm going to have to go. Yeah, do you have one question? Go ahead. Ever, ever? did you have a question? Well, more like so something that strange that happened. And I, I, uh, I swear, I, I saw a little dog and it was smiling. Uh -huh and radiating loving kindness. Now, I don't know how I knew, but I, that's something I've never seen before. That's Were you me. meditating when you saw this or did you just see a dog smiling? Because I see a dog I, I, I smiling. I was walking around. I was walking around in the park. And, well, yeah, and the dog was smiling? Yeah. <laughs> that, that's, well, that means that you've got the, the meta engine turned on. <laughs> So you keep smiling and the dog will take a biscuit in your pocket when you go. I mean, <laughs> that's how it is. When you're smiling, the dogs will start to follow you around. You know, you wouldn't believe what I watched last night. I was so, I had a headache and I thought I'm going to just, I have to get out of bed. And I got out of bed and there was Dr. Doolittle. <laughs> I've never seen it before. All these men just talking to all the animals and... <laughs> What's the funniest thing? We have ducks here and the duck, um, there's a tiger actually here in the backside of the property. And we're not sure, they're not sure what happened, but um, two of the ducks got killed and there were three ducks that grew up together. This duck has been so lonely. And just yesterday a monk shows up and he gave us a duck. And now there's two ducks in this pond and you, you wouldn't believe how happy that duck was. And they're, geez, it was really something. So the ducks are even crazy here. We have a kingfisher. You know, you ever see a kingfisher? You look it up, um, you ever see a little bird? It's like only this big. He's got a little, really cool little beak, you know? And this bird has so many colors on it. I've never seen anything like it. The blues and orange and yellow and red, it's amazing, this kingfisher. And he sits on top of the Buddha statue outside my door. I'm on the pond, right beside the pond. And uh, it's fantastic. This little bird just shows up and sits there and waits for something. If you sit on a chair long enough on my little tiny porch, he will dive down and get a, like a frog or a small fish. He'll do it. But only at a certain time of day, you have to be there. I tell you, this, this place is something else. <laughs> So, Everett, you keep smiling. I want to hear who you gave the smiles to this week, okay? That's what I need, okay? Smile delivery reports will be due next week. Uh, we will have a short quiz on did you, did you pucker your cheeks enough and was the muscle working, okay? That's what we should do, okay, everybody? Let's put our hands together. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And we have no idea where the bell is. <laughs> this is certainly a problem. We don't know where the bell is. Ding, ding. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>